Hey, good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's me, just without a beard and not actually there with you today. Um, this is not an intro to our guest speaker uh, today. Actually, we're going to do uh, the teaching aspect of today's service here at Freedom Calvary via video. Uh, the reason being, it's not my favorite thing to do, but I just can't be there uh, physically with you right now as I'm uh, halfway around the world uh, in your time. And so this is being pre-recorded, um, and this message uh, is extremely important in the sense of kind of establishing where the church is at, where it's going here, our local body of uh, Freedom Calvary. And so uh, some of the guys uh, and I in the leadership team uh, felt it was best that this actually would come from me today. So it's all good. Uh, modern, I know. Some of you are thinking, oh, I could have just stayed home and watch this. It's like watching TV at home. Well, not quite the same. You usually don't have this many people at your house and you're not singing worship songs unto the Lord uh, before and after. Uh, the message. So thank you for being here this morning. Once again, I do apologize. I can't be there in person, but in essence, it's probably one of the best illustrations of what it is that uh, the Lord, I believe, is going to do with our body uh, moving forward as we just finished the Gospel of John last week. There was a section in uh, John chapter 21, if you don't remember me talking about it or if you weren't here and you haven't actually gone online to watch it, John 21 uh, is important to the future of the church in that we see that the leadership of the church lost sight of what it was supposed to be doing in the very beginning. Instead of marching forward with the uh, unction of the Spirit who was trying to lead the guys to see that they needed to be about their father's business, which was fishers of men, not fishers of fish anymore, they kind of went back towards what was familiar with them. And so the fate of the church was at stake. Uh, the fate of the gospel going forth was at stake. And so God uh, sent Jesus on some very specific missions post-resurrection to help the disciples to see what it was that they're supposed to be doing. And so as the church moves forward, and as the church age begins with these uh, 11 disciples who would then also have uh, Paul added to their ranks, uh, we see that the plan of God is to move the gospel forward, the kingdom of heaven forward, uh, through the preaching of the gospel through people. And then this structure, or this organization, if we want to refer to it as that, really it's more like an organism, is given some very distinct uh, guidelines, boundaries, settings, so that we would understand exactly what it is that God is looking for in his church. And I'm going to kind of harp on this probably until I actually am in the presence of the Lord, is that the church, the church of Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ, is composed of people. Uh, buildings are just tools that God allows the church to use, but the reality is, is the church is the people. And so for in order for the church to grow, God has basically given a plan that it would be the church members, the church, uh, the people that make up the church, that would be the vehicles that would carry the good news, the gospel, to the entire world. And you see the maps behind me, and uh, you can't see the one off to the other side, but the world is this uh, place where the gospel needs to be taken to, and it's not so much the places that we see up on the map, but it's really the people that are in those places. Currently 197 uh, countries on the planet. Who knows what it'll be next year as kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. But the Great Commission that we went over when the students from Calvary Chapel Bible College of Indianapolis were here in Matthew 28, tells us that as we go through life, we're supposed to be making disciples of all the nations. And so the church needs to understand its purpose. The church needs to understand its mission. But the church also needs to understand its structure. And that's what I'm going to go over today. As we continue uh, to move on from our study outside of the Gospel of John, we're eventually going to find ourselves in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is really going to be the framework for how we're going to move through the rest of Scripture, uh, probably until some of us go to see him face to face, 
or until we fly. Uh, I could easily see uh, this framework of using the book of Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, as we will look at different concepts within all of Scripture as we use the book of Acts as our guide, and then as we look at all of the epistles during the time when they actually fall in the book of Acts chronologically, uh, that that could take a long time. I'm unfamiliar with this being done in any other church. Uh, I just felt it was an unction of the Lord and shared it with some of the guys on the leadership team and they thought it's a great idea and I thought, okay, let's move forward with it because it's the scripture and it's the uh, power of God unto salvation. We know the good news, the gospel and this word of God, this scripture never returns void. And so this morning, if you wouldn't mind turning in your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, uh, we really only have one, uh, two main areas of Scripture that we're going to look at, but then there's going to be a whole lot of other Scriptures uh, dealing with the church leadership as God intended it. So if you haven't gotten there yet, Acts chapter 4, uh, uh, forgive me, Ephesians chapter 4. If you get into your New Testament, you get to the Gospels right there. Uh, after the Gospels, you'll have Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, and then you'll get to uh, the book of Galatians, and then to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 11 today. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. And as we turn to it, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would plant it deep within our hearts, change our mindset, and help us to see our part in the body of Christ this morning. If we've already known it, reinforce it, and if we haven't understood it, make it clear to us today. And Lord, as we look at leadership today, would you help us to see that leaders are simply people within the body who've been given the blessing and the responsibility of helping everyone else to see what their part in the body is. It's never for lordship, it's never to rule over, but Lord Jesus, you made it very clear, leaders serve. And so we pray, God, this day, that you would help us all to be better servants of you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you think of the body of Christ, well, guess what? Those words given right there and that specific word, the picture that is given is a body. Now, we know there are things like a body of water, a body of work of literature, um, uh, there's your auto, your car's body, you know, it's the external framework of something that help us to understand what it is and what its function is. Now, when God talks about his family and talks about his, uh, as we would mention earlier, organization, but probably even better, it's best to look at the church as an organism. Why? Because the picture that's given us throughout scripture is a body, as in a human body. Now, I believe it's very, very clear why God did this is because, guess what? Each and every one of us knows what a body is because each and every one of us has a body. Now, the reality of this is, is are our bodies all the same? No, but in general, they are. And so what I love about this is in the big picture, we see that the body of Christ is something that everyone can relate to, but then the individual bodies, the individual places of worship, the individual uh, groupings of people that come together and would look at them as a body of, part of the body of Christ, are all very different. 
they all have some basic main tenets of the faith, which basically qualifies them whether they're part of the true body or not. But there is diversity allowed within this, just as we see diversity within our body parts. Obviously, if our body parts were all the same, would the body actually be able to function the way that it does? And the question is obviously very clearly no. If you picture the head, uh, your head, on top of only a hand, or where every single part of the body is a hand, it isn't going to work out well, is it? No, and that's why God made it very clear that this is the beautiful picture that he wants to use us to understand what the body is. Now, in this uh, passage of scripture that we read, uh, we see that there's some very specific things that Jesus himself gave as far as positions and abilities within the body, beginning in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. And so you'll often hear this term, the fivefold ministry, and you'll also hear maybe some arguments over whether really it's only a fourfold ministry or five, because if you read that right there, um, it's some, 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 and the last one is pastors and teachers. Well, let's settle this once and for all right now. If you go back and look at the original language, what you're going to find is this is what it actually says. It says that the uh, original text gives, he gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. That's what the actual literal reading of the original text is. That word sum only comes in the very beginning, and we can basically see then, and this really kind of makes sense even uh, more so if we just look in our life experience, um, that there is a fivefold gifting or fivefold offices that God has established uh, through Christ in his body. And so it begins with, he gave some to be apostles. Okay, what's an apostle? Uh, we know that the Great Commission calls us all to go out and to make disciples, which would be a disciplined learner. <coughs> but here we see that there are some that are called to go out and to be apostles. Those would be ones that would be sent to go out specifically for the purpose of establishing local bodies of believers wherever it is that they go. So the first of the five offices is that of the apostles. And I think of, I'm going to give you some people to think of in uh, the book of Acts that help us to maybe understand that. So when I think of apostles, maybe this morning, you can think of somebody by the man of Apollos. Apollos was one of the people who took the gospel message and basically uh, ran with it and went out and was establishing uh, faith in the hearts of local believers by taking the good news. Um, he was sent by the Spirit in the early days of the book of Acts. There was not yet a formalized church setting, but later in time we'll see uh, people like Paul and Barnabas that are actually going to be sent by the local congregations. And so you can be sent by the Spirit or you can be sent by a sending organization. Uh, the key thing is that apostles go, and they go for the express purpose of bringing the good news of Jesus to those who are lost and establishing local places for those people to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. Secondly, we come to prophets, uh, those that would speak forth the word of God. And to prophesy uh, in the verb it simply means to speak before. Now, that can be fill in the blank afterwards to speak before a large crowd or to speak in terms of time before something happens. And so the office and the gifting of prophecy has first and foremost everything to do with speaking forth the word of God, but sometimes it's in the sense of something uh, speaking forth the word of God in a specific event that God has revealed is going to happen in the future, but it also can be a much more general sense in speaking before a person or a group or a large group, the word of God. And so the office and the gifting of a prophet has everything to do with speaking forth the word of God. The third thing here, an evangelist. Okay, 
one who would bring the the, the good news, the the euangelion uh, in the in the Greek there for evangelist. Uh, remember when we went through the Gospel of John that the term uh, evangelism or euangelion was a very common term because it basically meant the message from, and at this time, uh, before Christ, it was really the euangelion of Caesar. It was the good news of Caesar that was being proclaimed uh, to all uh, the world through the Roman Empire. And so when Jesus comes on the scene and his followers now become the evangelists who take the euangelion of Jesus Christ, to the world. Uh, that is why they were seen as revolutionary. So evangelists are those that take that good news. And I think of uh, Philip, I'm sorry, back even before uh, with the prophets, thinking of Peter, thinking in the book of Acts, how in chapter two, how he, under the unction of the spirit, brings forth the word of God. And there's much transformation in people being converted. And then as we moved here to evangelists, I think of Philip, as the Lord moved him to come across the Ethiopian eunuch on the chariot who was reading the book of Isaiah and couldn't understand it and how God took him there to open up the scriptures to him. And then immediately after the baptism of this new convert, Philip's gone. Literally, a tr scripture says translated to someplace else. And so um, evangelists are those that take the good news uh, wherever they're going to go. And that's kind of really like a focus. I think of also, too, in a modern sense, uh, Mike Thompson, who will be moving out here, really has a gift and a heart for evangelism. Uh, he wakes up thinking, uh, how am I going to be able to impact somebody today with the gospel? How am I going to be able uh, to listen uh, and to, their, to them? And how am I going to be able to share my testimony and what God has done in my life in a way that would hopefully uh, plant seeds that will come to fruition. Um, so there's a different kind of a, a mindset in, in all of these uh, five-fold uh, offices. Uh, the fourth one, pastors, um, those that would tend the flock of Jesus, those that would be the tenders of the flock, just as we saw uh, God calling Peter uh, through Jesus last week in John 21, that one of the three aspects of Peter's ministry that Jesus was restoring and calling him now to would have to do with shepherding the flock. You see this in the writing of the half-brother of Jesus, James. Uh, James, an early leader of the church, uh, totally, totally focused on helping those who are followers of Christ uh, to be nurtured in Christ and to grow in Christ. And then lastly here, uh, teachers. Now, I want to make it very clear again that in that original text, as I'd read it, uh, this is a separate office, a separate gifting. Um, those that would be instructors of the word. And obviously, I think in the New Testament, we see that there's a man by the name of Paul, who was probably the primary instructor of not only the early church, but of the church in general, even today. And obviously, that's the Holy Spirit working through Paul, but the Holy Spirit had given Paul giftings, and also the church recognized Paul's office or his position within the body as a teacher. And so these positions within the body need to be recognized by the rest of the body. And guess what? The way that a body works naturally, we all recognize the uh, necessity for the function, the office, let's say, of the big toe. Anybody who's ever had issues with their toes will understand that while your toes are acting normally, you may not uh, understand their position or their purpose. But I tell you, you break a toe and now you try to move, guess what? The entire rest of the body has to deal with the fact that the toe is not acting at full capacity. And so here we have this just one example of the beautiful picture of how God wants his church, his body, uh, to have structure. And here we have in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11, the outlining of at least these five aspects of within the body. Now, it's very important for us to see that the purpose for these 
offices and these giftings existing are what? Look here in verse 15, speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Um, in essence, the body is producing something that I mentioned earlier that might be a little bit hard for us to comprehend the way that the spiritual body of Christ is supposed to look is that all of these aspects, these different parts of the body are all supposed to be growing up to look more like the head. And obviously this is not my head, it's, but it's the head of Jesus. And so in the physical realm, we get this beautiful picture of what a body actually looks like physically, but then also uh, how the church of Jesus looks like a body spiritually. But it's not the exact same because every single aspect of the body is supposed to be growing to look more like Jesus. From, verse 16, the whole body, joined in it together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. Just like in a regular body, every single part does its share. It causes the growth of the body for edifying of itself in love. And hopefully some of you are going, this sounds familiar. Well, we kind of put up that graphic every week that's rolling and scrolling through that is our tagline uh, for the ministry here. Exalt Jesus, uh, equip the saints, and engage the world. That's exactly where I got this from, uh, just giving it kind of the alliteration to help us to memorize it, or to be able to have it kind of subliminally and bliminally uh, put into us that the whole reason why we are part of a local body of believers that we call Freedom Calvary is to, number one, first and foremost, to exalt Jesus, second, to uh, equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, and third, uh, to engage the world, because that's how the world is going to hear and be changed by the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So within this setting of the letter to the Ephesians, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks uh, through Paul to give us these fivefold giftings. But in the book of Acts, as we're seeing as the early church develop, we see something that's pretty radical that happens here. Uh, it happens in Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Um, if you'd like to turn there, you can. You don't have to. Um, it'll be up on the screen here, thanks to the giftings of Wes. Thank you, Wes. Acts 14, 23 says this. And so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Up until this point, all throughout the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, this term elders is used. But it isn't until here that we see that elders has more of a connotation of a position that is has that is uh, led and ordained by the Holy Spirit than what it meant before, which is primarily somebody who's a leader in that community because they're older. So they've lived longer, they have more life experience, they have wisdom, they have discernment, um, and they're older. And that's part of the reason how they got to be older is they acted wisely. But there is this concept though of change from all of scripture right here in Acts chapter 14 into something to where it's actually more important that it's a spiritual position of leaderships. Uh, we see they had appointed them. It isn't that they went to the churches where they had established uh, local congregations of believers and said, who are the, all the old people? And the old people automatically become, by the oldest person there, the leaders. No. Uh, culturally, there definitely was respect for the elders, for the elderly, but if they were not acting in wisdom and they weren't living according to biblical truth, then guess what? They wouldn't have been appointed an elder in the church. Uh, we see it also, too, as you study through the books of Timothy and Titus especially, that this position of eldership is something that is extremely important to the church. Deacons and bishops or deacons and elders, uh, those two functions, and basically when you go through, uh, and when we go through, and when you get to see it, uh, the summary of the difference between a deacon and elder uh, in the books of Timothy and Titus really boils down to just one thing, and that's the ability to be a teacher. 
A deacon doesn't necessarily have to have the gifting to be a teacher, an elder does. And so we are going to look at uh, the biblical qualifications for eldership, because at the end of the message today, I'm going to introduce to you uh, the leadership of the church, the deacons and the elders, and I'm not going to specify uh, which is uh, w what group that each of these uh, six men who have uh, committed themselves to serve all of us as being one of the elders, and I would make... I apologize if you've noticed if there's a difference in the actual way that this looks. The computer that I was just using to record actually just kind of shut down uh, while I was recording, and so I've had to transfer it to another, and at least to me, the coloring is different, so I apologize for that. But I also want to encourage you, um, obviously there's a spiritual battle. It's been tough to get to this, a lot of technical issues, and I believe it's it's something that the enemy just doesn't want us to understand clearly because if we don't understand the church, if we don't understand our roles, if we don't understand mission, uh, then how can we actually go about uh, defeating, uh, being part of what God is using to defeat the effects of the enemy in so many different people's lives. And so uh, we continue on. And as I was saying, uh, that I would be the seventh of the elders uh, here at Freedom Calvary. And so um, I, I want to make it very clear that these terms and why we're going over these aren't so that you would know who's going to lord over you. I actually know it's, it's going to be who is going to serve you. And so as we go through these today, um, when you hear the term elder when, you, elder, when you hear the term bishop, when you hear the term uh, pastor, um, guess what? These terms really in the New Testament are somewhat interchangeable. They have slightly different variances in what they actually mean. Uh, but the main thing is that what we want to see is, biblically, what is it that God wants the church leadership to look like and to behave like? And that's what I mean by look like. There isn't the specifics on height or external things, but it's really more of behavior because behavior reveals character. And so uh, we're going to look at seven areas primarily uh, and the model that we've kind of always used within the Calvary Chapel system is referred to as a Moses model. Um, we're actually today going to look at something, a biblical eldership model. I believe it's the uh, New Testament's design for how the church is supposed to look. And so that uh, as we see that there's a group of leadership, just as the early church had uh, with the disciples, that we understand that, hey, if the quote-unquote you know, what we refer to as the senior pastor, as the pastor, as the lead pastor isn't there, uh, at the service, then guess what? Things continue just like they did in the early church to where one of the leaders would stand up and basically be the one to bring a message. And so that is why we have a plurality of leadership here. It's also not just for the sake of being able to deliver the message, but also there's a better accountability system when we're looking at the plurality of leadership. Um, bottom line for it though, I just believe that it's what Scripture is very clearly teaching uh, in the New Testament, how the New Testament church is supposed to act. And so uh, there's a great book that was written on this called Biblical Eldership by a man by the name of Alexander Strauch. And so uh, a lot of what you're going to hear is kind of how he's formulated it, and I think it's good, so I don't think I need to reinvent the wheel here. If you want to see it in its totality, uh, see Heather, and I'm sure you'll be able to get a copy of it. It's called Biblical Eldership by Alexander Strauch, who's actually a local Colorado guy, which is pretty cool, up in Littleton. So, section number one out of the biblical qualifications. Uh, first, why are there biblical qualifications for leadership? Well, very simply put, we understand that not everybody uh, is very good at seeing things the way that God wants them to be seen. And so biblical leadership, first and foremost, is ordained by God. Um, anybody, listen to this, uh, who desires 1 Timothy 3, 1, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of the overseer, he desires a noble task. Uh, number one, uh, the, the desire for eldership has to be from the leading and the motivation of the Holy Spirit. 
both within the person who desires to lead as well as those who have been given authority by God to give them a position of leadership. So it has to be something of the Spirit. Now, just because it's of the Spirit does not mean that we don't see in the physical realm justification for what that is, obviously. Um, but these scriptures are here to help us to remember that it must be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Uh, listen to 1 Peter 5, 2. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. And so if you're going to be a leader, uh, a servant in the house of God, in the corporate organization that we would refer to as the church, um, guess what? It needs to be something that you do willingly. Uh, and that shows pretty clearly. Ever since we started almost two years ago, there are those who've been coming early morning to set up whether it's chairs, uh, whatever they can do. And guess what? Um, those are the types of outward evidences that somebody is willingly serving, willingly desiring to serve. And yes, uh, spiritual leadership really does begin at the menial labor level. Um, so often people show up and want to be in the pulpit, but they aren't willing to lift a finger to do anything else. It's like, I come from a background to where that just will never happen. Uh, menial labor, menial tasks are evidence of the, what's on the surface of what's going on in somebody's heart as far as their dedication, their love for Jesus. And so we must be willingly ready to serve and to do it joyfully in whatever capacity that God allows us to be. Uh, cheerful toilet scrubbers are an amazing, amazing testimony of the goodness of God. In people's lives. And uh, the last verse that I have for you here concerning this uh, first number one, uh, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. Acts chapter 20 verse 26. We must realize that spiritual leadership is a gift from the Holy Spirit. If we see it that way, guess what? We approach it very, very differently than if we see it just as our job. Very, very differently. If it's a gift from God, guess what? It's a treasured. It's something that is seen as something that is, oh my, 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 I get to go to church to serve today. I get to go be with the church. I get to go to the worship service today and serve. Versus, and I got to get up early and do that again. And that's also a good kind of... Uh, reminder to each and every one of us is, are we seeing things in the proper perspective? Are we seeing it in a way that God sees it? It's a gift to serve. So the first one, that the desire for eldership has to be from the leading and the motivation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the second point we're going to look at uh, biblical eldership or leadership today is that character counts. Uh, there's going to be several sections in this one. So uh, number two, character counts. Uh, under that sub point A, um, a good reputation. Look at what scripture says. Uh, in 1 Timothy 3, 2, we're called to be above reproach. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2 also calls us to be respectable. And then in 1 Timothy 3, 7, that we are well thought of by outsiders. And that's not outsiders of uh, people who like to just go out hiking and go climbing mountains. No, it's outsiders of the biblical community or the community of faith. So it's basically telling us that even people who are non-believers in general should have a good idea of who we are. Our, re our reputation with them should be that we're people of integrity, people of character. They may say, yeah, they are one of those uh, crazy Christians or one of those religious zealots, but in general, the reputation is that they're people of their word. Uh, they obviously believe what they leave, and they believe what they believe, uh, and they obviously are different. And yeah, they don't drink, they don't uh, do drugs, they don't smoke, but they are different. Something that from that outside world that piques their interest in why it is that we're different. It's because we have a good reputation because we're following after the things of the Lord. Secondly, uh, 
those who are going to be leaders, uh, the family life has to be different. In 1 Timothy 3, 2 and in Titus 1, 6, uh, it's very clear that they have to be the husband of one wife. So in our marriage and in our sexual life, we have to be different than the world standards. We can't be playing around. We can't be adulterous uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we have to be committed to the one that God has given us as a helpmate to go through life through. And this is extremely important because we have seen so much within our own branch of the body, uh, within the Calvaries lately, that this is not being upheld. It's not being lived. And so we're seeing issues. Uh, for our church leadership, we're held to the standard, one wife, one husband, uh, it's that clear. And you have to be a man to have a wife and a woman to have a husband. Uh, that's being challenged within the church now too. Old Testament, New Testament scripture is very clear on that. Third thing under character counts, um, family life in re reference to children. In 1 Timothy 3, 4, you must manage your own household well. Now, there's a lot of uh, debate on this, um, but let me kind of put that in a simple perspective. If every pastor who had a child that went astray couldn't be or shouldn't be a pastor, uh, you wouldn't have any pastors. Uh, the, 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 the whole concept of what's happening here is that we as leaders in our households need to set an example, but you can't force changes of heart within your own family even. Granted, you can, yes, manage them well, and they should have respect for their parents, but can you actually make all of your children believers? I think if that were the case, we'd go back to the very first high priest by the name of Aaron, and when his sons Nadab and Abihu offered holy fire and God struck them dead, God did not remove Aaron from his office. We must understand that while this calls us to manage well, um, it doesn't mean that your children are perfect. And churches have done so much harm to pastors and missionaries' kids because they expect them to be perfect because they're the pastors of the missionaries' kids. Uh, they're humans. They're in process. God's got them all on individual wheels that he's fashioning and forming them and whom them to be. Other flip side of that coin, though, is that the spiritual leaders of the households need to be training up those children in the ways of the Lord. And Scripture promises that when they're old, they won't depart from it. The time frame between training and becoming old can often be a long period of wandering in spiritual deserts, just like the children of Israel did for those kids, though. But the principle is there uh, that management of the household must be well. Uh, the fourth thing, personal self-control. There's a lot of things concerning this that are enumerated both in Timothy and Titus. Let me run through them just real quickly. Uh, Sober-minded, self-controlled, not greedy for gain, not quick-tempered, not quarrelsome, not a drunker, disciplined. All of those things boil down to that you have the ability to simply say no to a lot of the lusts and desires of the flesh and to a lot of things that the enemy is going to come throwing at you to try to get you to stumble and to fall so that people who are part of the local congregation will also fall. Remember, this has always been a scheme and a device of the enemy to strike the shepherds and to scatter the sheep. So leaders are under shepherds. Jesus is the great shepherd. He's the head. But he's also given these positions that we saw as part of the fivefold giftings of being under shepherds to help the church to stay on the right track. Well, guess what? The devil's going to come and hit in all of these areas. And so it's very important for biblical leaders to stay the course and to resist the devil and to watch him flee. Next point, relational skills with people. Uh, in Timothy and Titus, again, uh, look at these characteristics that we should be seeing evidence in the lives of all of our biblical leadership. Gentle, upright, not quick-tempered, not quarrelsome, not arrogant. So once again, these character traits are important to see in the life of our leaders. Why? Because these, uh, probably most, uh, 
display the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the life of a leader. And while those fruits should be displayed in the life of all believers, especially among leadership, should we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faith, goodness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. That is evidence of the Spirit at work in the lives of people. Uh, next section here, uh, hospitable and loving. Uh, Timothy and Titus once again that leadership need to have some type of gift of hospitality. Uh, they have to be willing and open to giving and being lovers of good. Does this mean that they're always having people over to their house or that we can basically go up to them and to an elder say, hey, I'm coming over to your house for dinner tomorrow because you're an elder in the church and you're supposed to do this. Eh, no, that's not a correct understanding of it. But that they do have a heart and an openness and a willingness uh, to take care of others. Once again, all falling under that beautiful word servanthood. And that's really what leadership does, uh, what, what leadership really does in the spiritual realm. Uh, next section, personal integrity. Uh, once again, uh, Titus, Timothy, Peter as well here, uh, that biblical leaders would be above reproach, that they would be examples to the flock, they would be not greedy for gain, they'd be upright, they'd hold firm to trust the, worthy, uh, the word as taught, and that they would be holy, that they'd be set apart. And so biblical leaders, all of these character issues need to be evidenced so that we would see and know that the Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of these people. Uh, lastly, under this section, uh, spiritual maturity. Uh, in 1 Timothy 3, 6, we see that the elder, the deacon, the spiritual leader must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with the conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. And so there must be spiritual maturity displayed. And spiritual maturity does not always mean being old, because you could have come to the Lord in a young age or been raised in the church and exhibit much spiritual maturity that does not disqualify you from being an elder because you're young. As a matter of fact, Paul is very clear under the unction of the Spirit to young Timothy, his protege, that nobody, don't allow anyone to, to despise you because of your youth, but to be an example to them in word, in deed, in action. Uh, this is the biblical principle that holds for all of us. Now, all of these character issues that we've just gone over here right now, some would say, and maybe some of my deacons and elders are sitting there going, man, I don't measure up to that. Uh, none of us do. And so why is the standard there? The standard is there for us as a group of leaders to be able to look at somebody and say, yeah, they have, uh, in essence, are getting passing grades. Uh, they're, they're not getting a D when you take all of these things into account. Uh, and so none of us are going to be perfect. And so if you're going to try to, you know, oust us in leadership because we're not currently, by what you're looking at, seeing in one section not doing well, well, that's probably not going to happen unless it's something of gross nature. We're all in process. Uh, we all need God's grace. Uh, but we all are looking at these standards and saying, okay, Lord, we need to live up to these and we want to live up to these and you're helping us to grow in these areas. But there's always going to be a need for grace. And if there is no grace, guess what? There's never going to be anybody in church leadership because we are not perfect people. We're in the process of perfection, which is the process of completion, but that is always going to be something that's going to need time as God continues to work things out in us. And you know one of the ways that he's going to work things out in us? Um, it's through <laughs> challenges and through areas that currently maybe we're not the greatest at. Okay, uh, on to number four here because we're running behind, I'm sorry. Uh, three, I'm sorry, uh, which we mentioned earlier that we need to lead as leadership an exemplary lifestyle, that we need to be examples to the flock. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. Now, once again, as I just mentioned, exemplary doesn't mean perfect. However, it does mean in the event that somebody were to see uh, one of the church leaders out in public doing something that they felt was inappropriate, uh, they have every right to approach that person in love and deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. Not to go 
post it on Facebook, not to go tell other people, but in love to get first clarification that what they saw was true. And then secondly, uh, just to lovingly remind them that they're a leader in a local congregation, which means that their actions should be different than the rest of this loss and dying world. Okay, number four, um, that they would be committed to the word of God. Titus 1.9 he must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And so the uh, blessing, I believe, of being part of the Calvary Chapel tribe is that there's always been this commitment to the word of God. But we must remain in that same vein, committed to the word of God, learning it, studying it, and then applying it to our lives and being obedient to it until we see him face to face. Uh, number five, able to teach and devoted to prayer. And this is, as I said earlier, this is really the distinction between uh, a deacon and an elder, is that an elder must be able and gifted to teach. Um, be able, in verse uh, Titus 1.9, be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And Timothy as well, able to teach. And then in the book of the Acts, uh, six, chapter six, verse four, We'll devote ourselves to prayer and ministry of the word. And so this ability and this devotion, uh, teaching and prayer go hand in hand. And for uh, those who will be teaching from the pulpit, I guarantee you um, they'll be praying because if you haven't taught much, uh, guess what? You're probably in fear and trepidation coming to that place, which is always a good place to be because we're standing and representing the Lord before people. So we have to be prayed up. We have to lean on him and his understanding. Number six, uh, servants. First Timothy 3.10, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve. Okay, so part of the serving process and part of the testing process, forgive me, is actually seeing how willing someone is to serve, how naturally they help, uh, because it's probably one of the most telltale signs on whether somebody is called to be in church leadership is whether they are willing to serve in menial ways, things that others would see as uh, not very dignified or not very important. Uh, the desire to serve in this type of capacity is very, very, very revealing. Now, the last of the uh, things that we're going to look at today is the public appointment of elders. Um, but before we get to that, I want to read to you from Acts chapter 6. And if you uh, would turn in your Bibles with me there, Acts chapter 6. Yes, you hear the sounds turning, pages turning. Acts chapter 6. Look at what verse 1 says, starting in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected Excuse me, in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brothers, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Par Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. <coughs> This, pub this public proclamation of these seven as being uh, the leaders of the local church at the time in serving. Okay, they were brought along really to be servants. That this public proclamation of them being noticed and recognized is what we bring ourselves to right now. And so as I continue to talk right now, um, would Doug Duffy and would Larry Fannin steal and would Wes Thomas and would Carl Trost and would Ray Montoya and would Alex Nuzo make their way to the front? And I know this is going to seem a little awkward because I'm 
on video. But what I would like you to do right now, congregation, as they come forward, if you feel so led, you can get up and come and lay hands on them. If you would like to just stay where you're at seating and raise a hand towards them, that's fine. If you'd like to stay where you're seating and not raise a hand towards them, that's fine too. But here's the deal. Um, we see here in Acts chapter 6 that it pleased the people that they were going to have leaders, not just the apostles because they couldn't handle it all. And in that vein and under that understanding, beloved, I can't do it all either. I'm not even there with you today because of other things that I'm doing uh, for the sake of the advancement of the gospel and the kingdom. And so as you are making your way around and as you're going to come, we're going to pause the video eventually. I guess we have to wait for uh, me to stop and then Wes can pause it and then Wes can get up there and uh, get in there. And unless he's got Linda back there working this right now um, or somebody, we're going to pray. And you're going to pray as the Lord leads you. And I've asked uh, the worship team today that we've scaled back the number of songs that we normally do because uh, we needed more time for the message and we needed more time for prayer as we acknowledge the fact that the seven of us, and I'm there in spirit, you're basically laying hands on me as well, um, that we are committing as the seven to lead according to these principles, and you as the people who are being led are committing uh, to uplift us, as well as to hold us accountable to these. Now, once again, I'm not giving this message to turn you into the Christian Gestapo, who's now going to be stalking all of us in our homes and planting bugs and wires to try to see where it is that we fall short. Uh, we'll admit it to you. We're, we fall short. But we're not going to fall short in a way that causes, Lord willing, anyone to stumble or anyone to walk away from Jesus. And so we're here to serve you. We're here to love you. And right now, um, as the Spirit leads you, uh, go ahead and pray. And uh, Doug, if you wouldn't mind designating somebody there uh, if, uh, to, to be the closer and the opener. And uh, we're just going to take some time. And then after you're done praying, uh, we'll click the button and I'll close our service today. It's an awesome privilege to be part of Freedom Calvary and to serve you. And we are going to be a church that, Lord willing, is not only led by the Spirit, but by filled with the Spirit. And we're going to do things maybe a little differently than many people are used to, but we're just going to simply try our best to exalt Jesus, to equip you, the saints, to do the work of the ministry, and then that we would all engage the world together to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, for only in him is there hope. And so as the worship team comes up to continue, as we uh, close out with one song of worship today, um, would you see your life, please, as an offering unto the Lord? Would we all see our lives as offerings unto the Lord? And would we gladly, as Paul said, pour those lives out as a drink offering, that we would pour it out as a free will offering unto God and watch him do the amazing things that he wants to do in our lives individually and then in our life as a local church body corporately. Father, thanks so much for all that you're doing. And God, we just desire that you'd continue to be glorified in all our lives and for all the unspoken needs that are out there. We lift them up for the spoken ones. Lord, we lift them as well. And Lord, this day we simply want to glorify you. And so Lord Jesus, have your way in all of us. And I do pray, Lord, that just as we saw in the book of Acts in the sixth chapter, that after this happened, after there was a really dissemination of the authority of the service in the needs for your church, that we see that the church had said it, it grew. And it grew exponentially. And so uh, thank you for just bringing all of the people that you're bringing here. And Lord, we pray that you would start using us as a harvesting tool for the gospel. You've brought a lot of people in uh, who haven't been walking closely with you. You've brought people that haven't had a place that they felt 
as a local congregation they could be part of. Uh, Lord, simply now make our light at Freedom Calvary bright and shining for the lost. And thank you for all that you're going to do. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.